This is the day. Blessed Jesus, come to me, soothe my soul with songs of peace in everyone as we continue in worship. Bless. Jesus, we love you. We worship and adore you. Then we'll sing this twice and then we'll hand it over to Pastor McConnell and everyone as we worship. Jesus.
praise the Lord and Pastor McConnell. We're delighted to see so many of you out tonight as people are still filing in. There's a hymn that we haven't sung for a long time. It's a devotional hymn, and I want you to sing it tonight. It's number 86. 86, the sands of time are sinking. The dawn of heaven breaks. The summer morn I've sighed for. The fair sweet morn awakes. Dark, dark hath been the midnight. But day spring is at hand. Glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Choir sing this. I don't think the young ones even know that. <laughs> Brought it out of the archives tonight. A wonderful old hymn. Let's stand to our feet. <coughs> Everyone. <coughs> the sands of time are number 80, 86. Or, yes, it's 86, and everyone, if you're coming in, get that lovely hymn, and we're on the third verse, with mercy and with judgment. Come on. <coughs> with mercy.
lovely old hymn. <laughs> Will you say, Praise the Lord? <laughs> We're going to sing the lovely last verse and come into the attitude of prayer as people are still coming in and getting seated. But it's just wonderful to see this multitude gathered here tonight. I've wrestled on toward heaven against storm, wind, and tide. Come on, everyone. I've wrestled. singing the hymn 86 and we're going to sing that lovely fourth verse again and come into the attitude of prayer as people are getting seated oh i am my beloved and my beloved is mine come on oh I a sinner. Come on. <coughs> I'm just a
Gracious Father, tonight, cover this great house and cover this great congregation assembled with the precious blood of the Lamb. We we'll breathe the name of Jesus and we plead the merits and the efficacy of the precious blood of your Son. And we can honestly say, I stand upon his merit. I know no other stand, not even where glory dwelleth, in Emmanuel's land. We love him tonight. We love him because he first loved us. What a wonderful Savior. We worship Him tonight, and we adore Him. We say, my Lord and my God. Father, now shut us in with Yourself. Bless the choir as they minister to us. Bless the reading and the expounding of Thy Word. And make this old story tonight. Make it real. Make it alive. Make it real. Let the Holy Ghost take hold of it. Let him apply it to every heart. Grant that when the net is thrown out, that men and women will run into the ark and trust the Savior. Hear our prayer this night, not forgetting those that are bereaved, that thou wilt comfort them. Those that are still in hospital, that you will be with them. We pray that you'll be all that they need. Now shut us in with thyself and we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. Let's enjoy the choir. <coughs>
fine voice tonight. We're going to receive from you the Lord's offering and let us give as he has prospered us. Don't forget the tape desk in the middle of the foyer. Order any tape you desire. Don't forget Geraldine is in the reception. We have a lovely brochure. And for you that are visiting us for the first time, and you that have traveled, and if you're visiting us for the first time, we want you to remember our visit. There's a group of ladies up there in the restaurant. They'll give you egg and onion sandwiches <clears throat> and a drop of tea. And they're brilliant. They're really brilliant. So go there immediately after church tonight. Thank you very much. Praise, Praise the Lord. Let's turn in our hymn books again to hymn 500. And 94, hymn 594. We'll sing this lovely old hymn as the brethren wait upon us and we give to the Lord. 594. Let's remain seated for the first couple of verses then. It was down at the feet of Jesus. together then for the final verse it was down at me of Jesus where I brought the Lord then. You may be seated. We're going to enjoy the tabernacle choir again. And then tonight's subject, what happened to the carpenters who helped Noah build the ark? And I heard about this when I announced this last Sunday night. There was a wee woman sitting at the back and her wee lad was with her. <coughs> and he says, Granny, what happened to them? And just says, shush, they were drowned. <laughs> so <laughs> she answered the question straight away for me. <laughs> but it's more involved than that. <clears throat> Let's enjoy God's work.
Please, to the book of Genesis, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6. We'll begin to read at the ninth verse. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. <clears throat> the earth also was corrupt before God. <clears throat> and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the fashion which thou shalt make of it, the length of the ark, 
shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make in the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, where there is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all God commanded him, so did he. <coughs> And we know tonight that God will bless to us this remarkable story of His Word. Would you stand with me for one minute, please? <coughs> one minute. <coughs> Father, shut us in with Yourself. In that wonderful way of Yours, again we ask You to make time stand still, that we will be conscious of Noah's generation and conscious of our own. Speak to our hearts and deal with our hearts, Spirit of the living God. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> My objective tonight... <coughs> is not to prove to you there was a flood. Because no matter where you go in the world, even as far as China, and nations who do not accept the Christian gospel, you will discover that each country has in their own form an account of the deluge spoken of in the book of Genesis. They will tell you the world was destroyed by a flood. The flood, ladies and gentlemen, is an historical fact. But what men cannot accept is the idea of an old man building a wooden boat, preserving in that boat hundreds of different kinds of animals and having in that boat enough provisions to last them over a year. Let me tell you here and now, as a minister of the gospel, I believe the account of Noah and the ark with all my heart. And while I am not a mathematical genius nor a scientist, Please let me pose for you a few questions and some information that may help you to believe as I believe. Verse 15 of our chapter says, And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it, 50 cubits, and the height of it, 30 cubits. The traditional Hebrew cubit was believed to be the length of the arm from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. <clears throat> also, they regarded the cubit as one-fourth of man's height. So the commentators 
safely compute a cubit was about 18 inches. Working this out, they have Noah's Ark at 450 feet long, 75 feet broad, and 45 feet in depth. At this size, Noah's Ark was indeed a massive structure. But during the last century, learned Bible scholars have demonstrated that the ancient cubit was more than 18 inches. This was illustrated by a Mr. Greaves who traveled in Greece, Palestine, and Egypt in order to ascertain the weights, the monies, and the measures of the ancients. Thank God tonight for such men who loved God's Word so much that they dedicated their time and their energy to prove its integrity. He measured the pyramids in Egypt and compared the accounts which Herodotus and Strabo give of their sides. He found that the length of the cubit to be 21 inches and 888 decimal parts out of a thousand, or nearly 22 inches. Hence, the cube of a cubit is evidently 10,486 inches. Working this out, the ark's length was 547 feet, its breadth 91 feet, two inches, and its height, 54 feet, eight inches. If you, my friend, will examine these dimensions closely, you will find Noah's Ark to be a vessel whose capacity was more than sufficient to contain all persons and all animals said to have been in it with sufficient food for more than 12 months. I challenge anyone tonight to refute what I have said. Now, since Mr. Greaves' time, scientists and mathematicians in this 20th century who believe in Christ's finished work on Calvary's cross and are born again of the Spirit of God with all their modern aids, have made the ark just that little bigger. As I said, Mr. Greens made the ark's cubit 22 inches. They have made it 22.5 inches, resulting that the ark was 563 feet long, 94 feet in breadth, and 56 feet in height. Any man here who knows anything about shipping will admit Noah's Ark was an ocean liner size. That's why I've taken great pains tonight to give these dimensions. Noah's Ark was an ocean liner size. Not until the 19th century was there built a vessel that extended Noah's length. On displacement standards, The ark was a ship of 66,000 tons. Think about that tonight. The ark was a ship of 66,000 tons. One mathematician commenting on this said, the ark had a volume of 3 million cubic feet, and virtually the entire capacity of the ark could be used for storage, equal in capacity to somewhat in excess of 1,000 standard American railroad freight cars. <clears throat> I, I don't know if you've ever seen an American standard freight car. I have driven in the United States, and particularly in towns and Texas, where <clears throat> the railways go through town. It's amazing how one waits on these long freight cars. 
1,000 standard American <coughs> railroad freight cars. Just for interest, consider now the weight of the ark. <coughs> a meager knowledge of ship construction will reveal that a ship of that size would require a very large single central rib or keel just to support the sheer weight of materials alone. One can build a tiny vessel using basket weaving techniques, but not a giant liner. The framework of the ark alone must have been an engineering masterpiece, laminated out of many skillfully selected and precision planed separate pieces. This proves to me that Noah's world had skill. Noah's world had knowledge. Noah's world had ability, not equaled until recent times. And what about the men who built the ark? Noah and his family. What were they like? <clears throat> It took a man with sufficient mind power, resources, and experience, backed by the power of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, to take on a project and to warn the world to flee from the wrath to come. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're not telling you a fairy story. We're not telling you a strange story. We're telling you of a magnificent story of God anointing a man to build a liner to save the world. Something else occurred to me about the ark. When I think of building, I think of money. Just like you, Pastor. Must have cost a small fortune to build the ark. This man, Noah, must have been capable of managing great wealth to finance the cost of building the ark. Where did he get the money? Think about that tonight. Where did he get the money to build the ark? Obviously, no accurate figures can be given, but an estimate is available in terms of modern ships and similar size. I worked in Harland and Wolves as a little message boy, and then I went from department to department, the calculating squad, and then I went and stayed in the design squad, which I loved and enjoyed so much. But in 1963, Upper Clyde shipbuilders completed a large utility boat carrier, 550 feet in length, 75 feet wide, and 47 feet high, a size similar and somewhat smaller than the ark. It was complete with engine and one deck, but without fitting. And that ship's cost was 1,500,000 pounds. That was in 1963. Just the bare ship. No other materials. <coughs> Add them on. Taking the bare ship to tonight, that ship would be worth a 1996. About 12 million pounds. <clears throat> 12 million pounds. How did Noah finance this? No matter what the comparative costs were in Noah's day, the ark required colossal resources to construct. This was hardly the backyard effort of a primitive river dweller. <clears throat> This was the work of a genius. <clears throat> this was the work of an old man, empowered, anointed, 
sanctify by the Spirit of the living God. And he built something that glorified God. So, friend, in the light of all these facts, do you still believe that Noah and the ark is a funny story which we tell our children? The story of Noah and the ark is so relevant to our day, its message literally makes me tremble. For I remember the words of my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was God manifest in flesh, and he believed in Noah and the ark. Listen to him in Luke chapter 17 and verse 26. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Christ believed it, and that's sufficient for me. He mentions Noah's generation. He mentions the ark. He mentions the flood. Christ believed it. And you can rest your entire life and soul in his hands, for he declares in John chapter 14 and 6, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Ah, somebody says, how did Noah get all those animals into the ark? Now, we've talked about its construction. We've talked about its cost. Now, how did he get all those animals into the ark? The answer to that is simple. He didn't get the animals into the ark. It was God who got the animals into the ark. There's no record in the narrative of Noah going out with cages and with nets and with teams to capture animals. Those animals, when the time of judgment had arrived for the antediluvian world, were moved upon by the power of God in their different kinds to walk up Noah's gangplank into the ark. When I thought about this, the truth suddenly hit me. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, we have God saying to Noah, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, and his days shall be. 120 years. God gave Noah's world and a generation a time limit to repent. Did you hear what I said? God gave Noah a generation a time limit to repent. 120 years. At the end of that 120 years, only Noah, his wife, and his three sons and their wives were saved. But the rest of Noah's world went on in their sin, and so God took his spirit away from them. <clears throat> but look where the Spirit of God goes. The Spirit of God goes into the hills. The Spirit of God goes into the forests. The Spirit of God goes into the fields. But look what comes moved upon by the Spirit of God. Every kind of animal in twos and in sevens running up to Noah's ark, fleeing from the wrath to come. And here the antediluvian world sees this. Animals in pairs coming together. Animals in sevens coming together, heading for one direction. The old man and his sons and the gangplank up that ark. My friend, every poor dumb animal that walked or crawled up Noah's gangplank was a testimony and an affront to that blatant unbelief of Noah's world. Let me advise you, my unsafe friend, if the Spirit of God through the weeks 
has been convicting you and showing you your need of a Savior. That means the same Spirit that strived with the people in Noah's day is striving with you. Don't reject God's call, for it may happen to you as it happened to the antediluvian world that God's Spirit may not strive with you any longer and you'll be left dead in trespasses and in sins. I believe there's men and women in Belfast tonight who have shook off the Spirit of God that often and have said no to the Spirit of God that often. If they came here tonight and came every night, they would never get saved. For the Spirit of God has left them. But look, the Spirit of God goes out into the hills and the forests and the mountains, and the animals are drawn into the ark. Now, maybe you think I'm hedging the original question, how did Noah get all those animals into the ark? I'm not. It was God who got them in, but I think what you mean is, how did all those animals fit into the ark? That's maybe what you mean. How did all those animals fit into the ark. First of all, God specifically instructed Noah to select one pair of every kind, male and female, Genesis chapter 6, verse 20. And also in Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, he was told also the clean beasts by seven. The clean beasts by sevens. Now here's what happened. The Spirit of God brought these animals to Noah. And Noah stood outside the ark and selected them. And that's fantastic. From the hills and the valleys and the mountains and the fields, they were drawn. And Noah selected them. By the way, the term kind in the Bible refers generally to a group of creatures, all of which interbreed. The horse kind is represented, therefore, by one pair of animals, and the same would be true also of cats and dogs. Oh, there had to be cats in the ark. Do you know I love cats? <clears throat> now, if you notice in Genesis 7 and verse 22, we are told, all flesh died in whose nostrils was the breath of life. All flesh died in whose nostrils was the breath of life. So it is clear that only air-breathing animals or terrestrial were included in the ark. This excludes virtually all sea creatures and simple forms of life which are not harmed by water. Think about it. It's logical. God's Word is wonderful. Brothers and sisters, God's Word is not stupid. Some of his servants might be, but his word's not. And some of his people might be, but God's not. The experts tell me 60% of the animal kingdom lives in the sea. 60%. And 70% of land animals are insects. The remaining 12% of the animal kingdom are of the average size. I said average size of a Reese's monkey. Remember I said the ark had a storage capacity of 1,000 freight cars, giving each pair of known modern species of insect 16 cubic inches of space. Only 21 such freight cars would be required. And if you count the Genesis kinds, only the required space is far less for larger creatures. One expert, you know what he did? He wrote to London Zoo <clears throat> asking for information on how much space animals require. Their answer was, most animals can be maintained in very close confinement indeed for long periods and remain perfectly happy. A Reese's monkey, say, can be maintained indefinitely in a cage about two feet six inches cubed, 
15 cubic feet. So come on tonight, friend. What's your problem? Who are you trying to kid? The story's true. The story's true. Throw up your arguments. The story's true. Maybe you don't want to believe. But let me say this in closing this particular point. Recognizing that only kinds, not species, were in the ark. There were the far fewer animals. For remember, most animals are unclean. And Noah was commanded only to take two of each. As far as I can see, the only problem Noah had was what to do with all the room that was in the ark. For it had three stories. And so viewed from the perspective of scientific fact, only one of the three decks was plenty to accommodate all those animals. Friend, it's amazing how this old book has stood the test of time. It will still be standing when you've gone. Huxley, Payne, Ingersoll, Voltaire, men who dedicated their whole lives to destroy this book. Where are they tonight? Their bones are running away. They're not here, but this book is still here. The communists in Russia who started the Red Revolution in 1917 under Lenin said, and this was Lenin, my struggle will never cease until the myth of God is moved, removed from the mind of man. Lenin's dead. Communism crashed. And God still lives tonight. Friend, you can't bury truth. It will always spring forth again. They buried my Lord Jesus Christ, the King of truth, and the third day he rose again. Yes, my friend, you can believe in the story of Noah and the ark, for the story's true. The story's true. But may God help you tonight to believe the message of the ark. It's not just the story. It's the message that the story brings. That is, in Christ, you have a place of refuge from the wrath that is to come. The ark was a great refuge which held all kinds of creatures. And our Christ tonight is a great refuge who saves all kinds of sinners. The ark was an immense vessel, and it floated a multitude of animals which were saved. Christ's salvation tonight is an immense salvation. And in it shall be delivered a multitude which no man can number. I'm going to say something now that may startle this great congregation. I believe Noah employed carpenters and caulkers and shipwrights of various kinds to help him build the ark. See, the ark had to be made of special wood. God called it gopher wood. It was pitched inside and outside to make it watertight. Noah would have to go into the forests and cut down literally thousands and thousands of trees. Think about that tonight. Thousands and thousands of trees. Then strip them and then shift them. Now, how could he do that? Strip them, then shift them to his dry dockyard. He had to saw those logs into planks and make a three-story compartment, one for his family of eight people and of the people that he hoped would be saved. Another for the hundreds of animals of every kind that God was going to bring and the other for provisions lasting over a year. For Noah and his family was closed in the ark for about a year. Can you picture Noah hiring men to come and cut down the trees? Hmm. Eh? 
It was a terrific age. I don't know how they cut down those trees, maybe with axes or maybe with great circular saws. I don't know, but it was an intelligent age. Can you picture Noah hiring men to come and cut down the trees? They are willing to come after all. They're getting paid for it. Even if it's an old eccentric, an old fool who's paying you, I'm giving him a hard day's work, even though he's nuts. A huge ship in a dry dockyard, and there's a flood coming, and they've never seen rain in their life. Because at that particular time in the world, the earth was watered, and the vegetation was watered by a mist that came up from the ground at night. But rain never saw it. And here this old man built that ark well, pitch it inside and outside with pitch, make those measurements perfect, skilled according to the blueprint that God had given him. Build it well, build it tight, and build it secure because the flood's coming. And you see those men looking at each other and saying, he's crazy, he's really crazy. But every day they worked, Noah and his sons testified to them of God's coming judgment. But they refused to believe God's message. And so the years drifted on. I don't know how long it took Noah to build it. But God gave that generation 120 years. I wonder how many years he's giving this terrible generation in which we live. A generation where they slay children. A generation where there's pedophiles everywhere. A generation of filth and corruption and every evil thought and every imagination in men's hearts. How long is God going to give this generation? And so the years drifted on until God's time limit expired. God was finished with the antediluvian world. They had sinned away their day of grace and the end of the world had come. Not only did Noah preach his best, ladies and gentlemen, and his most earnest as the end drew near, but every tree that fell in the forest and every plank that was laid in the ark, every axe stroke and the echo of every hammer was a louder and ever louder call to the men of that corrupt and violent day to flee from the wrath to come. But sad to say tonight, the very men, the very men without whose help the ark would never have been built, the very men who felled the trees and planed and led the planks and careened and caulked the seams of the finished ship, those very men failed to take a passage in that ship for themselves, for their wives and for their children. Sir, are you saved tonight? Lady, are you saved tonight? You come to church, but are you saved? You pay into the church, but are you saved? I'm going to ask my choir, are you saved? I'm asking everybody tonight, are you saved? You may work about the ark, but you're not in the ark. You might love the ark and love the atmosphere of the ark, but you're not in the ark. And you're not in it. And your wife's not in it. And your children's not in it. And you're going to fail to take a passage and not ship for yourselves and your wives and your children. Many a skilled and high-paid carpenter. Many a strong-limbed and grimy-faced blacksmith. And many a finisher and decorator in woodwork and in iron must have gnashed their teeth and cursed one another when they saw their children drowning all around them and the ark shut and borne up and lifted up above the earth and the fountains of the deep opening. And God sending the rain and the tidal waves from the ocean, beating it upon the earth. It must have been colossal. Men running to mountains, the highest peaks, only to see their children slip away. And they slip away into eternity. 
Friend, when God judges, he judges. Listen, when God is mercy, he is mercy. But when God judges, he judges. And is this not a picture of many church-going people tonight and of many of the ministers who preach to them? They go to church, they work for the church, they give to the church, but the real truth is they're not in the church. For there is only one way to be in Christ's church, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who declares in John 10 and 9, I am the door by me. Did you hear what he said? I am the door. Somebody said, there's many doors. There's not many doors. If you notice in the measurements of that ark, there was only one door in it. One door. A cubit. Fit in a bomb. And you know, there's only one door in the church. And Christ is that door. There's ministers that says there's many ways. There's not many ways. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way. Pastor Buddha's a way. Muhammad's a way. Yes, they're all a ways. But Jesus looks at Buddha and Confucius and Muhammad and he says, who are you? And he sweeps them aside and he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Oh yes, you can visit Buddha's shrine. Here lies Buddha. His bones are somewhere here. Here lies Muhammad. His bones are here. Here lies Confucius. His bones are here. But when you go to the tomb of Jesus Christ, you'll see two young men sitting in white linen, and they'll say, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> For he is risen. I am the door. By me, salvation exclusively and completely and utterly is in him. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Friend, do you realize what I'm saying to you? Are you saved? Are you born again? Do you know the Savior? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Can you tell of a day? Can you tell of a month? Can you tell even of a year, an hour, when you realized you were a guilty, hell-deserving sinner? When you looked up to Calvary's hill and saw on that middle cross one bearing your sin, dying in your room instead. Friend, if you've never realized these things, Pastor, I haven't. I haven't. Well, then let me tell you faithfully. Let me tell you lovingly. Let me tell you sincerely, if you've never realized those things, you will be left outside the ark when God's burning judgment strikes the earth. David the psalmist had this vision of the coming judgment of God, and David also had his personal ark of refuge. Listen to him in Psalm 27 and verse 5. Listen to what he says. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. Isn't that beautiful? For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. He shall hide me in his pavilion. Hallelujah. He didn't say hallelujah. It was me who said it. He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon the rock. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. There will be an atomic war. Scientists are frightened of it. Scientists still believe it will happen. Some bad man will press a button someday and end it all. But here's my ark, Isaiah chapter 32, and verse 1 and 2, and it says, Behold, the king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a covering from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Hallelujah. There's my ark tonight. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding. May every one of you tonight find your ark of safety. 
in our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't he lovely tonight? Isn't God's Word a wonderful book? Come on, isn't God's Word a wonderful book? Stand up and refute it. Come on, refute the story. You can't. It's a wonderful book. Because it's God himself. That word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we're told he came on to his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him. To them give he the right to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of the will of man, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. Isn't he lovely tonight? Will you say, praise the Lord? May God take this story and bless it to your hearts. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer? Thank you for your wonderful attention. Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. I don't want anyone moving about, please. Thank you very much. I don't want anyone moving about here at this appeal. All right. No one, please. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. The Spirit of God is speaking here. Is there a man here tonight? Is there a woman here tonight? Thank you, lady. Already I see your hand. The Spirit of God is speaking. Is there another one tonight who will say, God bless you, sir, sitting there in the second row. I see your hand. Thank you. Is there another one tonight? Thank you, sir. I see your hand down there. Is there a man? Is there a woman tonight who will realize their need of God already? Three people have surrendered to Christ. Is there another person tonight who will say, Pastor, I need Christ. I need the Savior. I need my sins forgiven. I'm not right with God. Is there another one tonight? Quickly and quietly. Lift up your hand. Take it down again. We'll see it and pray for you. You're not right with God. Thank you, friend, to see your hand. Is there another one tonight? <clears throat> Quickly. Is there a, there's a one over there. God bless you up there in the gallery. God bless you. There's another one down there. Thank you. The Spirit of God is here. Is there another one tonight who will say, yes, yes, Pastor McConnell, I, I need the Savior. I'm not prolonging the appeal tonight because, listen, I've told you the story as it is, told you simply, give you the measurements, what God was saying. Thank you, lady, I see your hand. Is there another one tonight looking up at the gallery now? A big crowd up in that gallery. Is there a man up there? Is there a woman up there? Young man, young woman, boy or girl, quickly and quietly. God bless you, young man up there. I see your hand. Thank you. Is there another one? God bless you, young girl. I see your hand. Is there another one tonight? Just quickly lift it up and take it down again. We will see it. We will pray for you. Is there another one tonight? Oh, Spirit of the living God. There's another one. God bless you, friend. One of the deacons pointing out. There's another over there. God bless you, friend. Thank you. Thank you, too. I see your hand. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, listen, if God could speak to dumb animals, what about us who are supposed to be the glory of his creation? And yet we can say no to him. Isn't it, isn't it terrible that we can say no? But oh, I love the man and the woman who can't say no when they said I had to say yes because it was irresistible grace. Is there another one tonight? Is there another one tonight? Say, Pastor, will you pray for me? I need to be right with God. Is there another one? Just God bless you, son. I see your hand. Is there another one? The Spirit of the Lord is here tonight. Brothers and sisters, in half a minute, 13 people have come. And that's not an unlucky number. There's no such a thing as unlucky numbers in God's sight. Hallelujah. It's His grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Is there another one tonight, quickly? Is there another one? Can I see your hand? Where are you? God bless you. Way down there, I see your hand. Thank you. Young person, you may take it down. God bless you, young woman. That's lovely. Is, is there another one? Is there another one? We're waiting for you. Fourteen people now have responded. We're going to sing. God bless you. There's another one. I see your hand. Oh, the Lord is lovely. 
going to sing just as I am about one play. Christian, will you sing? Oh, what must have been like? Can you see Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth standing outside the ark and those animals coming? And do you know something? Here's a thought that occurred to me. So many animals. Maybe some of them carpenters that were helping building the ark. Noah would say to those men, help me tie these animals. Here, help, help me here. And them men wondering at these animals coming and yet not part of it. Is there a church worker here tonight and you've never been seen? Is there a church deacon here tonight and you've never been seen? Is there a church elder tonight and you've never been seen? Is there a minister here tonight and you've never been seen? <coughs> That's how real it is. Oh, may God help us. As we sing it, we're going to sing it twice. Will you raise your hand as we sing it? Fifteen people now have surrendered to the Lord. What does God's people say? Are you ready then? Come on. Just I Is there another one tonight? Looking up in the great gallery. Is there another one? Can I see your hand? Is there another one? Oh, God. Hi. This is the final time we're singing it. Can you hear God saying to Noah, the seventh chapter, the first verse, Come thou, and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen faithful before me in this generation. And you see Noah saying to God, Right, Father, we're going to go into the ark, but just let me go down to the village where those carpenters are, where I've given them their last wages. Let me go down for the last time and tell them to come. God given Noah leave. Noah and his three sons going down into the village. Please, it's coming. Will you come into the ark now? The sun is still shining. The birds are still singing. The men look at them and say, You're silly. It's not coming. But I'll tell you here and now, friend, you know what's coming? Death is coming. Eternity is coming. The judgment of God is coming. And you need to get right with God. This is the final call tonight. Will you raise your hand? As one old Puritan put it, he says, it was God's last message to a dying world. Right now, will you raise that hand as we sing it for the final time? Come on. Just I. Is there one more? Where are you, sir? Where are you, lady? Is there one more? Is there one more? Is there one more quickly? God bless you, young man. Thank you. God bless you, young woman at the front. God bless you. That's wonderful. God bless you, young woman. I see your hand. That's wonderful. Is there another one tonight? The Spirit of God is here. This is the final call. Is there one more? Oh. Hi. Oh. 
That's it, that's it finished. I'm not calling anymore. Nineteen people have responded. Oh, Spirit of God, thank you for your gracious work. Now, Spirit of God, seal those people. Seal them on till the day of redemption. Save them for time and eternity. For I pray, is there a backslider here? Is there a man? Is there a woman that used to walk with God? We're told Noah walked with God in his generations. Noah was off that lovely line. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening. You used to walk with him and you've drifted. Is there a backslider who would love to come back to the Lord tonight? Is there a backslider? Would you quickly and quietly lift up your hand and say, Pastor, remember me in prayer. I want to come back to the Lord. Is there a backslider tonight? Would you raise your hand? God bless you, young woman. I see your hand up there. Thank you. Is there another one? Is there another one tonight? I'm asking once more. I'm finished. Is there another backslider? Would you raise your hand? Can I see it right now? There's another one pointing down there. Thank you. God bless you. Is there another one? Is there another one tonight? Then, my friend, we'll leave the issue. There's another one. God bless you. Isn't it wonderful what God's doing? I think it's 22 people. There's another one that's raised their hands. That's marvelous. There's another one over there. God bless you, young woman. Isn't it wonderful? I'm trying to stop this appeal, and people are still coming. Is that not the Spirit of the Lord? Come on, God's people, what have you to say to this? <laughs> Will it stop now? Will it stop? I've tried to stop a few times. And I believe it's God's last call to some people in this great house tonight. In fact, I believe it's God's last call to some of his own people in this house tonight. Because you're not playing the game with God. All get right with him. Those people that raise their hands, will you pray this prayer? Will you pray it out loud? Hear yourself doing it. Hear yourself calling for mercy. Remember this night and call upon him. Are you ready? Let's pray together. Father, I come to thee. In the name of thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you sent into the world, to save my soul. Thank you for his work at Calvary. The shedding of his precious blood. The giving of that sinless life. Take me as I am. I'm a hell deserving sinner. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Come into my home. And bring me into your ark. <laughs> and save me for time and eternity. Keep your hand upon me from this night. Lead me on with thyself. For I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> on my left. Pointing directly, when you go through the doors, there's a McGee room. It's a beautiful room. It's a library. It's really a library. Brother and Sister Young will be in that library. Also, Pastor Shaw Higgins. You dear people that raised your hand, would you please go in there for just a couple of minutes? We will not keep you. We know that you've traveled. We know that you've cars, and you've got to get home to children and whatnot. But you've prayed that prayer tonight and you've listened to God's word and we're trusting that that seed was planted in your heart and it will grow up into 30-fold and 60-fold and 100. That's all we can trust and do. But they will give you some Christian literature. They will give you literature with phone numbers on it that you can contact me or any of my pastors. Contact them 
We are your servants for Christ's sake. But may God bless you when it's wonderful that people are being saved. Two got saved this morning. And now, 22 tonight, to God be the glory. Say praise the Lord. It's now just going after quarter past eight. We're going to let you out early if you behave yourself. For the next five minutes, will you stand in the Lord's presence? <coughs> what will we sing? I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Come on, are you ready? <clears throat> Everyone entering in, come on. I pledge you for those father who have come to you there's still those who are halting between two opinions oh friend if the Lord be God follow him and of being if he's Baal then follow him but give deciding grace to those that are halting tonight thank you for those that have came Keep your hand upon them. And for all of us who have to travel, whether it's just up the road or whether we have to travel miles, give us journeying and traveling mercy, covering every one of us with the precious blood of the Lamb. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide upon us until Jesus comes. Turn around and say hello. Go up and get a cup of tea.